I love this, the shove herd around the Hamptons, as you've dubbed it. <laughs> yes, yeah, totally. We were talking about artificial intelligence. Now we're talking about human stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> Kate Brown, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News, where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. We're back this week with The Roundup, where we dissect some of the headlines that have been causing a stir over the last weeks. Top of the list is the very dramatic goings-on at the British Museum in London, where a curator is under investigation for stealing what might be somewhere around 2,000 works of art from the collection. We're also going to chat about an intriguing development in the U.S. courts where a computer scientist made a bid to secure a copyright registration for an artwork that was made by AI, and it's been shot down. And then we're going to head over to Montauk, to the Hamptons, a typically quiet town that's in the midst of an art world dust-up and a bit of a row between two art dealers, Max Levi and Adam Lindemann. So, dramatic episode, let's get to it. With me today is our art critic, Ben Davis. Hey, Ben. Good morning, Kate. And we also have none other than Annie Armstrong with us this week, our wet paint columnist and art market reporter. Hi, Annie. Hi, how's it going? Good. Well, I'll start with one of what I think is one of the most astounding stories to emerge this summer, Big Trouble at the British Museum. Where do we even start with this one? The museum community was a bit surprised when Hartwig Fisher, the director of the museum, announced that he would be leaving the institution in the summer 2024. People don't tend to walk away from these big jobs, so it was kind of a mysterious announcement. What emerged in mid-August is that the museum confessed to the fact that gold jewelry, gems, semi-precious stones and glass dating back from the 15th century BC to the 19th century AD have gone missing from their collection. And it's not a smash and grab type of heist, but rather an inside job that's been carried out by a staff member. So the UK media went to work right away and they soon identified Peter Higgs, who's the curator of Greek collections and sculptures, as the person who might be behind this wrongdoing or is at least under suspicion. To note, his son told the media that his father denies all of this. But nevertheless, what we do know is that Higgs was fired earlier this year. So the next bad thing that happened was that they then found all these works on eBay, and some of them have been traced back to the British Museum's collection. The crisis deepened again when a source claimed that the number of works was, as I said earlier, like up to 2,000 objects. And then it deepened again, if one can believe it, when it came to light that someone had alerted the British Museum to this years ago, and the British Museum had done some investigation and had found no big issues and had sort of like called the case closed. So that brings us to last Friday when Hartwick Fisher, no big surprises, announced his resignation was coming a little bit earlier and he stepped down immediately and an investigation is ongoing. So this is certainly just the beginning of a big story. I've skimmed a lot there at breakneck pace, and I definitely have some thoughts on this one, but I wanted to turn to you, Ben. What was your first reaction to this news? My first reaction is that if I ever see uh, priceless antiquities from the 15th century before Christ for sale on eBay, it might be too good to be true as a deal, I guess. Yeah, it's like a full-scale hurricane force scandal for the British Museum that kind of came out of nowhere for me and not sure I know exactly what to think of it because, you know, it's still under investigation, but it is pretty staggering and I think pretty crazy how immediately it became political because the British Museum is under scrutiny for holding lots of looted antiquities from its imperial days. And so almost immediately, Greece came out and said, you know, well, if you can't keep your treasures secure, then maybe you shouldn't be trusted with the Parthenon marbles. Either they have a long-term quest to get back the Elgin marbles to Greece, a huge internet uproar in China with the state papers talking about how, like, if the British Museum, you know, has this level of shoddiness, then, you know, they should give back all their Chinese treasure they have immediately. I mean, it really has gone from eBay to full-on diplomatic crisis and institutional upheaval really, really fast. Mm -hmm. The works were on sale on eBay for very little. I think that was another issue, too. (laughs) Yeah, that's something I find really inscrutable about it. I mean, I guess these thefts, they weren't stuff that's on view, right? They are 
someone stealing from the closet, essentially, like stuff that's off views. It's kind of not very well cataloged. That's another whole issue here is like the cataloging seems to have not been very precise, which is kind of an invitation to someone to fiddle around with it. But these were on eBay. It's such a penny ante scheme. In one case, it was reported that one piece of Roman jewelry made from onyx, which was estimated by a dealer to be worth 25,000 to 50,000 pounds, was offered for just 40 pounds in 2016. Is someone like really just selling off stuff from the back rooms of the British Museum for pocket change on eBay, which is wild that's possible. It's wild that someone was doing that. Everything about it is gripping. It reminds me of what happened earlier this summer, too, at the Byler Museum. There was the front desk clerk that was skimming off the top of just the cash that was coming in and doing it over how many years? I think, like, several years and ended up collecting, Mm -hmm. like, over a million dollars worth from just within the museum. I just feel like this is the first time I've heard of crimes like this happening at such a rate. I guess that's true. I guess it does add up. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that how the scheme works in that movie Office Space? You uh, round up a fraction of a penny and then over enough time it becomes billions. It's interesting you bring up the buy alert because although it's a very different situation, it's a case of an inside job getting sloppy after a lot of work at something. So I think that's a real classic, you know. I believe that the antiquities dealer who was noticing this on eBay, what it sounds like is that the person who's being accused, if it is Peter Higgs, was selling mostly objects that were not logged as being in the British Museum database. So if you cross-checked, it was sort of suspicious, but maybe not evidence of any wrongdoing. And then I think over time, he or she might have gotten sloppier, and that's when they closed in on him. It's really staggering. And, you know, to go back to your point, Ben, about the political implications of this, I mean, the British Museum has been like, for the past five years, it's been like one bad press release after another. They've had to just been batting back all of these issues and they haven't been dealing with a lot of it very well. You know, like restitution has become a huge prominent issue in the cultural realm and it's really an important one. And France and Germany have done a better job than Britain and Britain was the biggest empire of them all. So it is a little bit troubling, especially because they argue, among many other arguments, that one of the reasons that they should keep these objects, not they, but just, you know, people who say that they don't want to restitute work, say that they should keep them in Europe because these are state-of-the-art institutions and there's experts and they're super safe and they don't want to give them back to African source communities because they might get stolen or damaged. And then you have this situation happen. So it's no wonder that immediately China and also Nigeria and Greece have doubled down with their restitution requests, like immediately in the wake of this, you know? Yeah, and I can't tell from what I've read so far, it is a little bit of a museum under this sort of constant low-level scrutiny. I can't tell how much of that factors into what's happened here because Hartwig Fisher stepping down kind of comes off of... Something that is a master class in how not to do crisis PR, because the dealer who discovered this on eBay, and incidentally, I think it's very funny that the eBay handle of the person who was selling these items was Sultan 1966, oh. uh, which is just very, very funny. But the dealer who spotted this and then apparently reported it, Itai Gradel, says that he raised this multiple times and they came back to him and said, not an issue. And so when this news broke, Hartwig Fisher, the director, kind of immediately tried to turn it around in his first interview on the whistleblower and said, we now have reason to believe that the individual raised concerns had many more items in his possession. It's frustrating that that was not revealed to us as it would have aided our investigation. So kind of like blaming the person who'd brought it forward. And then that's kind of why he's had to step down. Like he had to issue this apology saying, you know, like that was really poorly judged statement. But I guess I I assume that they wouldn't want to happen exactly what is happening. This kind of snowball effect where this particular issue activates all these other issues that they're under. And so... Yeah, I think this is, among other things, the sign of an institution under stress. Yeah, I mean, they had so much lead time to, like, handle this better. So it's really disappointing on a lot of levels. I um, understand why Fisher stepped down, especially after what you just explained. Although I think that the problems run so deep at that museum, like, I don't think chopping one head off is going to, like, solve this. But also in the UK, there's only two police officers assigned to cultural heritage crime compared to, like, 300 in Italy. So 
they don't even have the infrastructure beyond the museum to really deal with these kinds of cases. And maybe to close out, I'll quote quickly from Dan Hicks, author of The British Museums, which took the British Museum to task on its bending bronzes. And he said in The Guardian last week, what we're seeing is another sad incident in the slow motion car crash of the Victorian model of curation. So times are changing. And I guess as we're seeing old models failing, maybe that's a good segue to talk about new models rising up and all the challenges that come with that. So, you know, moving away from London to the U.S. and into the realms of AI, Ben, you wanted to talk about the story that was playing out in the U.S. courts, which is super fascinating. Can you give us a scoop on what's happening with this copyright court deal that just got turned down? So, yeah, this is what I the item that I wanted to talk about. Kind of big news in my world. Earlier this month, the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia rejected an attempt by the inventor Stephen Thaler to have an artwork created by an artificial intelligence that he made, which is called the Creativity Machine. He wanted this artwork to be copyrighted, and the court said no. The work is from 2012, and it's called A Recent Entrance to Paradise. And I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of this eerie, pixelated image of train tracks going through a tunnel. It looks very 2012 to me. Thaler had asked the U.S. Copyright Office to give the creativity machine the copyright. Like his, He wanted the machine to have the copyright, that he would then get it as the owner of the machine. They said no to him twice, so he sued them. And the court now has sided with the Copyright Office, which had said Thaler must either provide evidence that the work is the product of human authorship or convince the office to depart from a century of copyright jurisprudence. So basically, they're just saying only human-made stuff is copyrightable. This is one of a number of cases coming on the pike about creativity and artificial intelligence. It raises lots of interesting questions about what an artwork even is. So it's very interesting to me, but also very confusing. Are you guys as confused as I am? What do you think? I feel very confused about it. You were talking about it a little bit earlier that this copyright office is treating the AI tech as a photocopier rather than a camera. If you want to explain that comparison, that really helped me grasp this. An interesting nuance of this case, because it's being reported on as the courts strike down the idea that AI made art can be copyrightable. And it's actually a little more nuanced than that, which is this guy, Stephen Thaler, is a evangelist for AI as a living thing. And he didn't just want to have the copyright himself. The literal point of him filing the copyright claim was to say the AI gets the copyright. It's the creative agent here. His argument was that he should be transferred the copyright because it was work for hire that he owned the machine and that it basically was the same as if he'd hired someone to make something for him and then gets the copyright. So he really was trying to say the machine has the copyright and the copyright office is basically saying like, well, the machine can't have a copyright. I'm sorry. Like it doesn't count as a human agent. And you're either going to have to admit that you are contributing to the creativity here and name what your creative contribution is, or it's not copyrightable. I'm just curious about that because up until now, a decision has entered around whether it's there's a good balance between human creativity and algorithmic generativity, one could say. But this is sort of a whole different ballgame. However, I'm a bit skeptical of the premise because isn't he putting in prompts into this AI? Like, what does the image look like and how did he create it? It just seems a bit suspicious that he's like extracted himself from the creative process entirely. <laughs> well, look, again, this guy is an evangelist for the idea that the machine has life. This particular um, series is this whole kind of interesting conceptual series on the premise that an AI is like a brain. These images are supposed to represent what comes out of an AI generator as the brain is dying. Like They're the equivalent of a flashback you have right before you die, only on the premise that it is an AI that is dying, which is kind of interesting, although kind of macabre if you're actually projecting sentience and feeling into it, which he is. Like there are interviews with this guy where he talks about this really is an intelligence and it was a much more primitive form of intelligence than what people are working with now. I'll just say the funniest thing about this to me is that in this decision, they talk about 
all the precedent that consistently the Copyright Office has said that a non-human agent cannot produce copyrightable work. And one of the precedents they draw on is Urantia Foundation versus Christian Mahera, which is about whether this thing called the Urantia book, which is supposed to be a divine text communicated by the chief of the archangels of Nebadon, is a copyrightable text. And they basically found like, look, if everybody involved in this case, because both parties believe this was sincerely the work of divine beings, think that, then it is not a copyrightable text. Only the human-made parts of how it's arranged and written down are copyrightable. That has to be specified. And it's actually a pretty good analogy to this case. Like, this guy thinks that the AI is a divine agent. And they're just saying, like, if you believe that, if that's what you're claiming, that is not copyrightable material. What do you guys think about that? It reminds me of this old Star Trek Next Generation episode where the android, like, Data, I don't know if you guys watched that show. I rewatched it recently. Oh, I know Data. Yeah, Data begins like painting during a period of like self-discovery or whatever. And I was like (laughs) trying to remember the episode when I was thinking about this article that we were talking about. The next episode after that one, it's called The Measure of a Man. It's when Data tries to fight for his own freedoms and freedom of choice. So I just like love that even in like the 1980s, this idea that creativity and freedom of choice are just like totally fused as issues and decisions, you know, to be made in terms of agency. But what do you make of the reasoning here? I mean, it is slippery. I mean, Annie mentioned my analogy, which is they're treating like a photocopier, not a camera. Obviously, generative AI produces some creative stuff that can be used in better or worse ways. I mean, I personally just think that so much is creatively possible with generative AI with very little effort that it really changes the curve of what you find creative like i'm really struck i have an artist friend who like made a card game with these really impressive illustrations and i was looking at them thinking how impressive they were and thinking but i'm not that impressed you know like a year ago i would have looked at this material and been like wow it's mind-blowing art like how long did it take you to do that and now i look at it i'm like i mean you do that in mid-journey right (laughs) and my appreciation for this project moves on very quickly to like what are the rules of the game like how are you using these images but the images themselves just be kind of become an an ornament on top of whatever i'm judging to be the interesting part about it whole new definitions of creativity are emerging and it's interesting just how the policymakers are kind of rushing to catch up with this. I think what's also interesting is the flip side issue, which is the AI copyright problems that are emerging in terms of data scraping. Like a lot of creatives are getting angry and suing these companies for using their already copyrighted creations. So it's just like a total real storm on both sides of the coin with this one. And I don't think it's the last we're going to be hearing of it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I get irritated. I mean, because I have uh, Google's AI search turned on And it just rewrites your stuff, you know, in its own voice. It's not even like synthesizing hundreds of, you know, pieces of content into one thing. I mean, it will literally just scrape a single article, a a single thing and rewrite it in its own voice. So as a writer, you're like, well, wow, this really disincentivizes people doing original stuff. There is a real threshold that gets crossed at a certain point where this doesn't make a lot of sense. There's a real, you know, need to assert some kind of like uh, value to the human part of doing stuff when the machine makes remixing it so easy. Does this artwork seem original and interesting to you just on first look? It looks so retro web art to me. Like it looks really early (laughs) web art. (laughs) And like I said, it reminds me of like the Google generator that was the puppy slugs that came out in like 2014. It looks like that. That's what's remarkable to me about it is it's so old. It's mm. This is early web, early generative art. I guess it's like less about, in a way, what the art is and more about the point of yeah. taking this to court. It seems like it's almost interchangeable. That said, I, I also agree. I wasn't particularly moved by it. And it, there is some artificial intelligence that has been used in artwork that I think is really intriguing. This is just maybe not one of them. Um. <laughs> yeah, I think that the most compelling part of this to me is just how much Thaler truly believes that machines are sentient. Like we watched this interview, he appeared on like a local news channel and the interviewer asked him, is it ethical to create a sentient machine? And he said, well, maybe I should ask my parents if it was ethical to conceive me. That's how (laughs) deeply he believes it. I know that the news anchor was just like, her jaw kind of like dropped. She was like, 
got real awkward. <laughs> um, <laughs> another dispute playing out in the courts is happening around the artsy farmland in Montauk. <laughs> you got to transition. Yes. I know, right? I was, well, I mean, how to go from AI to Montauk, it's a hard one. Annie, you've been leading the coverage about this beef between two art dealers who are also neighbors, Max Levi and Adam Lindemann. I love this. The shove heard around the Hamptons, as you've dubbed it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, totally. We were talking about artificial intelligence. Now we're talking about human stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> that was better. I like that. Too. Yeah. Nice. That was a good transition. Yeah. So July 5th this summer, the day after the 4th of July, which is, you know, obviously huge out in the Hamptons, there was a physical altercation that went down between two art dealers in the Hamptons who have neighboring properties. And when I say neighboring, I've been out to the ranch and they're incredibly close. Truly just one dirt road separates them. So Max LeVay owns this property called The Ranch. It's private, but he hosts like tours where anybody can go and see the art there. Like he's hosted shows by Frank Stella, Matt Johnson is up right now. Chloe Wise was the show that was up at the time, I think, or it's up right now. So, you know, there's big names that go out there. Anyhow, his neighbor, Adam Lindemann, who owns Venus Over Manhattan in Manhattan, owns Eothin, which is the ranch that Andy Warhol used to own in the 80s. And it is his private residence. It's like his vacation home. There's a lot that led up to this point, but Adam goes over to Max's property in the middle of a private tour. Something goes down where they both get really upset with each other. Adam shoves Max, according to the police report, though he denies that, and says, what are you going to do about it, fat boy, is the line that was served. There's just been a lot of fallout on both sides of this altercation happening. I kind of outlined what led up to something like that going on. The truth is that we can't really know every single possible detail that happened, as many people with neighborly disputes know. As far as normal people, a series of annoyances can really lead up to a very dramatic climax. But what we do know is that at one point, Max hosted an Easter egg hunt with this artist, Jamie and Juliana Villani, who we know a lot about. She just hosts all these kind of kooky antics. She runs the Gallery of Flaherty's. But she did an Easter egg hunt where the winner, the person that finds a golden egg, gets one of her paintings, which was worth $150,000. The hunt lasted for, I think, about nine hours. And there were all of these different Our World Luminaries out there searching for this egg. I mean, you could just get a fortune by finding an egg. This internet artist, Brad Tramel, is among the people that are looking for the egg. He decides to go onto Adam's property to look for the egg, breaks his electronic fence, and I think that that was kind of the watershed moment that led to their annoyances with each other becoming much more than that, where they really just kind of can't stand each other, it seems like. But that's kind of some of the setup that leads to this very dramatic brawl. Nobody was hurt, hurt. You've been to this, uh, the, the ranch. I have been to the ranch. Yeah, it's really beautiful. <laughs> Is it worth getting into a fight for? I think so. It's right at the end of Old Montauk Highway. It's in a really beautiful area. It's right by Ditch Plains, which is so kind of the charm of Montauk versus the rest of the Hamptons is that a lot of the beaches are public. It has more of a salt of the earth feel than like East Hampton or Sag Harbor. There's all these dive bars around so you can like eat and drink cheap there. You can go to a public beach. <laughs> but that's not to say it's for the everyman. Like <laughs> their neighbors are like David's Werner, Julian Moore, obviously Adam Lindemann, Paul Simon is out there. The ranch is really gorgeous. It's not on the water, but it's situated on like these rolling hills. He actually does maintain horses out there. He has a rancher that is raising these horses for cutting competitions, which is like a rodeo sport. Cutting competitions, the objective is to separate one cow from the rest of the herd. So on a good day, you can go out to the ranch and see this guy, Western Saddle, geared up, training horses. So it really is a ranch. And then also Max, I think, has really innovative, interesting programming out there, like the Matt Johnson show that's out there. It looks really interesting. I was there for Jamie and show, which was with Mike Kelly, which was just a really good pairing. <laughs> I mean, I have like a million questions and comments. <laughs> the story is just so wild. I think that the backstory is really important to sort of parsing what's going on between these two guys. Can you explain a bit about the property and who bought what and when and where Andy Warhol figures into all of this? Because that's a lot of where the beef started, too, before Brad Trommel ran into the fence, which I'm still I have a question about that, but I'll come to it later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so, yes, this Andy Warhol, I'm not sure what year he bought. It. I think like the early 70s with his partner, Paul Morrissey. It was eventually sold 
both the ranch that Max owns used to be called Indian Fields. It was sold with the actual house, which is called Yothin, to Mickey Drexler, who is like a big fashion magnate. He used to own J. Crew. And then when Mickey Drexler decided to sell the two properties, he didn't originally want to separate them, but he ended up doing so. So I think Adam bought Eothin for tens of millions, I think. Adam chose not to buy Indian Fields as well, so that got separated. About four years later, I think Max LeVay comes in and buys Indian Fields and is going to use it as a commercial space. And when he does so, he makes the mistake, which he owns up to making the mistake, of marketing the ranch as being Andy Warhol's former ranch, which was not. Adam Lindemann definitively owns what was Andy Warhol's ranch. I have a quote from Vince Fremont, who was Andy Warhol's manager at the time, who spent a lot of time out at Youth and saying, that was never our property. We would ride horses out there, but it really didn't have anything to do with Andy. So I think that that delineation between what property was Andy's and like kind of having that trophy really started a lot of the tension between Adam and Max, who are just two interesting characters to be at odds with each other because they're so similar in a lot of ways. Like they're both brought up by polite society within the art world. They're both from these art world dynasty families, but their personalities can be more different. When I think about this story, I think that it's really like the immovable object of Adam Lindemann and the unstoppable force of Max LeVay. You had a follow-up to this story, which was saying that uh, possibly coming out of all this fuss, the town is considering looking at the permits for the ranch you're not technically supposed to like be running public event programming yeah that's right these residential properties yeah i can't say that i know a ton about real estate law but what did definitively happen is that max appeared in court because of a complaint filed by a neighbor we don't know what neighbor that he was using agricultural land for commercial use and so now the town of east hampton has authorized the local attorney to pursue legal action. We're not really sure what's going to happen yet, but it could be that the town decides to come down on the ranch and who knows, maybe shut it down at worst, at best uh, slap on the wrist and make him pay some fines. I do know that Max decided to open up another space that is like strictly commercial use. There's no residential use for a space on Gosman's dock, which is about a 10 minute drive away from the ranch. So that could be in support of his commercial exploits while he does maintain the residence on Indian Field slash the ranch. So we just have to see. It's really up to the town at this point what happens. Right. And it sounds really like also a dispute between generations of the art world too, right? Like it feels like Max is, you know, this millennial and has got the cool New York art kids coming up. And then there's this sort of Adams world of people, which is a much older set Upper East Side world of people I can imagine. So I guess my question is, Who's going to win? Like, who's got the, like, most influence in Montauk? I guess I know the answer, but I just ask it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, your guess is as good as mine. We'll see. I think that Max is very savvy. I mean, it's not up to Adam, but I just think they're both very stubborn people who have very specific desires out of their properties out there. Like, I can imagine being upset that his vacation home is now neighbors with this kind of not always raucous, but like occasionally raucous community out there. It's, it's, it's so <laughs> silly. It's such a <laughs> slip. I mean, it is a it is a classic rich people behaving badly kind of story. You say in it that Montauk is divided between Team Max and Team Adam. I can't say I'm on either Team Max or Team Adam. It, to me, it's a classic T-Rex versus Velociraptor situation. There's a funny detail in the story where Lindemann is really irritated by his new neighbor. But then isn't there a whole thing where he had at a certain point installed some kind of phallic sculpture on his property and that supposedly there's some thought that that was specifically about needling his neighbors in montauk i mean it is really like these people are very different but also in another way a little bit too much alike that's so true yeah i guess it's just like when you have a certain amount of money your petty actions can look like erecting a friend's west sculpture just to spite your neighbors (laughs) (laughs) which is just an unimaginable amount of wealth to me. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I don't know if there's a bigger issue here. It seems like the bigger issue, if I were going to try and, you know, 
make something edifying out of this is it's like there's a real estate story underneath it. Isn't it the case that Lindemann's trying to sell his property? That's right. He's tried and failed a few times. And that, to me, there's some question about, you know, like, things are in a little bit of a disarray in the art market right now. There are a lot of rich people looking to, you know, kind of like get some liquidity. I, I don't know what the situation is. All I'm saying is that, like, there is a way that tempers get more heated as the kind of economy slows down and then it becomes a little more aggravating when people are having a noisy party next door that you think might be like a liability when it comes to like selling your property. Yeah, it could be very telling about just the state of the market because for all intents and purposes, Max LeVay got the ranch on a huge COVID deal. I think that yeah, crazy deal. It was originally up for sale for twenty five million dollars. He got it for eight. I mean, Adam, it seems like is really trying to liquefy a lot of his assets. Like he had that giant Christie's sale earlier this year. He moved Venus over Manhattan from the Upper East downtown, which I'm not really sure if there's implications there. They had an auction sale that was called Adam, which is you know again the representation of the kind of egos we're uh, dealing with here. Right, exactly. He opened a gallery out in Montauk, too, which he's also closing, right. as you reported, right? Right, yeah, South Etna. Yeah, he opened this foundation during the pandemic. It's not shut down, but it's more of an idea now. <laughs> right. The physical location is now like an Australian workwear clothing store, but he's still curating shows under the South Etna name. So there's a few indicators that maybe Adam is trying to liquefy some assets. Hmm. So that's probably the bigger takeaway, but I think that for me, the biggest takeaway of this story is so much of the fighting that we see with these big egos, big money happen behind closed doors. And it's just kind of satisfying to see that they're just like us and like fights are petty. And we've all shoved someone and said, you know, what are you going to do about a fat boy? Right, I, yeah, Maybe they're not just like us, but <laughs> I just it's not as like prim and polished as you'd believe it is from just outside. And I don't think it's about to get better because as you wrote, there's some upcoming show, Drunk versus Stone number three, where you were, said there might be a soccer game where one of the teams is drunk and the other one is stone. So maybe not the most strategic move, or maybe it is. I don't know, but that should be interesting. Some broken Yeah, we'll see. I up. think that that is slated for, I think like two weeks from now, maybe. I might be wrong about that, but yeah, keep an eye out because I certainly will be. But yeah, Drunk vs. Stone, it's an idea that Gavin Brown came up with, I think. But Gavin Brown used to host these shows where half of the artists making new work while they were drunk, half of the artists making new work while they were stoned. And just kind of like what these altered mind states do to expression. Profound. And then so Max is going to make a, yeah, Max is going to make a, a literal manifestation of that through a soccer game where one team is drunk, the other is stoned. Which does sound really fun, but we'll see. Sounds fun. Sounds fun. Not, <laughs> not what, necessarily what you want your neighbor to uh, be getting up to. Yeah. To be yeah. getting up to. But yeah, sounds fun. Curious to see who will win on all the fronts. Wow. Much disgrace and uh, drama and infighting on this roundup. It's been colorful. Well, thank you for joining me, Annie and Ben. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. That's it for this week's episode. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili and Carolyn Goldstein. Thanks for listening and see you next week. 